I'd now like to introduce Christina Alexander and Emily Dubois. They are co-presidents of our Weinberg College Student Advisory Board, and they will be introducing our convocation speaker. And I will really miss them when they graduate. They have been a great duo as co-presidents. Larry Irving is the president and CEO of the Irving Group and graduated from Northwestern in 1976 with a degree in political science. He formerly served as the principal advisor to the president, vice president, and secretary of commerce on telecommunications and information technology. Due to his dedication to these issues in 1994, Larry was named one of the 50 most influential persons in the year of the internet by Newsweek magazine, which described him as the conscience of the internet. Larry is currently working on a new initiative that combines his technology interests with his commitment to social justice. Larry is the co-founder of an organization that works with telecommunications companies, philanthropies, and social entrepreneurs to promote the use of mobile technology to address global problems. Through technologies such as mobile phones and tablets, this organization addresses critical issues including healthcare, hunger, education, and gender inequality. We welcome Larry Irving as a Weinberg alumnus who serves as a model for us as we begin our postgraduate lives. He is a model not only of professional success, but of engaged citizenship, teaching us how we can use our um, talents to help our communities flourish. It is our sincere and distinct honor to introduce to you Larry Irving. Thank you, Christina and Emily. Um, very much appreciate that introduction. Good morning. Good morning, President Shapiro, Dean Mengelsdorf, Trustees Goldquist and Martin, Associate Deans, distinguished faculty, family, friends, and most importantly, my soon-to-be fellow alumni. So 37 years ago, um, I was sitting where you were sitting, listening to a convocation speech on my graduation day. And I don't want to be disrespectful, but 37 seconds after that speech was over, I didn't have a clue what the guy had said. 37 years later, I honestly can't even recall the speaker's name. So my bar for success today is pretty low. I just want to be better than that guy. <laughs> in fairness to that long ago anonymous speaker, I had a lot on my mind. I was looking forward to getting my diploma, not my box, we actually got diplomas in those days. I was about to say goodbye to my girlfriend, who I had met in the previous year, and was trying to figure out if we could sustain a long distance relationship. And I was thinking about the challenges I'd be facing in law school, and wondering if I was up to them. I was even thinking beyond law school and contemplating going back to my hometown of Queens, New York, or Brooklyn, where I was born. Brooklyn's in the house. Thank you, Brooklyn. Uh, <laughs> Brooklyn is always in the house. Um, and I thought I'd go back to work as a prosecutor or maybe in the public defender's office. Well, as it turned out, I never did go back to Brooklyn or to Queens to live, and I never worked as a criminal lawyer. I did maintain that relationship with the young lady, and uh, 38 years since I first met her, she's now my wife and still my best friend. So there's hope for those of you who are going to go into a long-distance relationship. Uh, most folks who know us attribute our longevity as a couple to my good fortune and her eternal patience. So when Leslie, that's my wife, graduated from McCormick, and I graduated from Stanford Law School in 1979, and for those of you doing the math, yes, she was a freshman and I was a senior when we met. It wasn't like that. I swear, well, but don't judge, anyway. <laughs> we, we moved to Washington, D.C., where I joined a large corporate law firm. And I'll be forever grateful for that law firm experience, but it was there that I learned the first lesson that I want to impart to you today. In your professional life, nothing's forever. I learned a lot at that law firm. I improved my writing skills, which are essential to anything. I paid down some student loans, but I knew that I hadn't found my calling. So for the next two, three, uh, for two to three and a half years I was there, I spent my time knocking on doors all over Washington, left my resume in literally hundreds of places, and then I got lucky. Through a friend, I met a young dynamic congressman from Texas named Mickey Leland. He was a third-term congressman, and he hired me to be his executive director, uh, his legislative director. And it was like taking off on a rocket ship. Mickey wasn't just my friend or my boss, he was my mentor. And I can't tell you how much mentors matter. Early in your career, if you can, find a mentor, not just a boss. And let me explain the difference. A boss primarily cares about what you can do to help her drive the success of whatever organization you work for. But a mentor cares about your work, but he, he or she also cares about developing your skills. 
they're invested in you and help you develop the skills you need, not just for the job at hand, but for life. Mickey threw me into the deep end of the pool, but he's always there to make sure I didn't, uh, didn't drown. At 27 years old, I worked on the creation of a, com a Congressional Committee on Hunger. I worked for a federal holiday honoring Martin Luther King. I had oversight of regulations reforming our national telephone system. I drafted legislation increasing opportunities for women and minority in our electronic media. I worked with Mickey on a presidential campaign, and I went to Cuba on behalf of the United States to negotiate the status of a convict who had hijacked a plane. In those days, the United States didn't have direct relations with Cuba. Mickey knew Fidel Castro through his work on juvenile health, and so the government sent me down to Cuba to negotiate that hostage. Mickey was the first man I ever heard describe himself as a citizen of the world, and he encouraged his staff to think global and to think big. In the four years I was with Mickey, I had gained more than a decade's worth of experience. But I remembered rule number one, and nothing is forever. Four years, and I knew I had more to learn, but Mickey knew I had more to learn, and I needed new teachers. So he helped me land a position with my second mentor, uh, Congressman Ed Markey, who I think is about to become Senator Ed Markey, um, who took over the subcommittee on telecommunications in the House of Representatives. Talk about luck. I'm a media junkie and I love politics, and I had responsibility for media policy for the United States of America, in, at least in Congress. And that brings me to my third message. In developing your career, follow your passion, but direct your passion to something that aligns with your, with your talent. We all know passionate mediocrities, and if you don't know any, just watch reality television any night of the week. I love technology, but I couldn't make much of a contribution writing code. I can do something with regard to writing policy, and that's how I've spent most of my career. I had the opportunity to direct my passion for media towards promoting, promoting the development of cable and satellite television technologies, developing guidelines for educational children's television, encouraging new independent voices on public television, and again, promoting opportunities for underserved communities for women and minorities. I had a spectacular six years working with the smartest people on the planet on issues I cared about, and it culminated in one of the toughest legislative battles of that period. So if you go back to the first President Bush, President H.W. Bush, Bush, he had 42 vetoes, 42 and 0. Every veto, every bill he vetoed was upheld. I was involved in the 43rd, and that was a battle. At issue was cable television, believe it or not, and there was a bill that I was working on to lower consumer rates and to promote more competition. Unfortunately, early on in the process, I almost destroyed the prospects of the bill in committee. Now, I was a committee counsel, and committee counsel is a pretty easy job when a bill comes up to committee. We just have to look at the numbers of members on the committee, divide by two, and add one. Now, even a poli-sci major can do that math. <laughs> if you don't have a majority, you can't move the bill. But I'd miscounted. One of the members I counted as a yes, overnight changed his vote to a no. So we came to committee, we couldn't move the bill. It was painful, it was public, and it was humiliating. We had to pull the bill down. We had to work for months to get that bill back, but again, my mentor, Ed Markey, rather than firing me, showed me how to get the bill through the process. We got the bill through the House, we got the bill through the Senate. When the President vetoed, we overrode the veto successfully. And that's message number four. When you lose, and you will lose in life, get up off the floor, fight back, and fight back harder. The cable bill became a campaign issue in Bill Clinton's campaign against President Bush. It helped frame the Clinton narrative that the Bush administration didn't understand consumers and didn't understand consumer issues. And my involvement in the veto override gained me lots of political goodwill with the Clinton folks, as you might imagine, and helped gain me a reputation for what passes as competence in Washington. I was an early selection for a position in the Clinton administration, and I was appointed to a position with a portfolio that included media, telecom, and technology, including this then new thing called the internet. My job working for another incredible mentor, the late Secretary of Commerce, Ron Brown, was to proselytize, evangelize, develop a policy framework for, and drive adoption both here and the United States of the internet. It was a great time and a phenomenal job. Now, almost all of you sitting directly in front of me, you can't remember a time when there wasn't an inter internet. But 20 years ago, when I was confirmed by the Senate, 1990, June of 1992, I was confirmed by the Senate for my position. Um, almost exactly 20 years ago today, when I took my job, there were two million people, million with an M, on the entire planet that had access to the internet. As I'm speaking to you today, there are 2.75 billion, billion with a B across the planet, who use the internet. But that growth didn't happen without effort. There were millions of people, probably including a lot of those folks sitting up behind you, who thought this whole internet thing was a fad, you know, kind of like Beanie Babies or the Macarena, <laughs> two other big fads of the 90s. And, and trying to explain the internet to folks in the early 90s was hard. And there were folks who literally thought I was loopy running around, you're going to love this internet thing, it's going to be great. Um, and that leads to message number five. If you believe that you're right, 
stick to it, fight for what you believe in. You're young. You're going to be wrong on occasion. People expect you to be wrong on occasion. But when you know in your soul that you're right, fight for it. During my tenure in the Clinton administration, I fought hard to bring attention to the digital divide. As computers and the internet became more commonplace, some people in some communities were being left behind. Some had more access to technology than others. To me, it just made sense that if we as an administration were going to laud this wonderful te technology that could do so much good, if we we're going to spend time and money promoting beneficial uses of the internet, that we had to ensure that it was deployed and used in communities that really needed the help that this technology could provide. To me, that's the essence of our democracy. And I was insistent that we live up to that promise. Fortunately, President Clinton and Secretary Brown agreed, and bridging the digital divide became an administration and then a global priority. Since leaving government, I've stayed involved with technology, and whether working as a consultant, as a co-founder of a dot-com startup with Magic Johnson, yes, that Magic Johnson, or when serving as a senior executive with a technology company, I've never lost sight of the transformative power of technology and the need to make sure that every person has access to it. So much of, we th of what we think of as commonplace today was unthinkable a decade ago. 1999, when I left government, half the people on this planet had never used a telephone. In 1999, half the people on this planet lived two or more hours travel time from the nearest telephone. Today, there are seven billion phones on the planet. Two and a half billion of those are smartphones that are basically computers that connect to the internet. Over the next five years, almost two and a half to three billion more people will get connected to the internet. It took us 20 years to go from two million to two and a half billion. It'll take us five years to get to another two and a half billion. I'm working with a group of people to build an organization, the Mobile Alliance for Global Good. We want to use mobile technology, particularly the mobile internet, to solve the world's most intractable problems, hunger, poverty, education, healthcare, gender inequality, lack of clean water, climate change. As recent events have proven, technology is not an unalloyed good. It's all about how people use it and what we prioritize. But every day I see opportunities to harness the power of mobile technology for good purpose. The best part of what I'm doing, or maybe the part that I just enjoy the most, is working with remarkable young people from all over the planet. Last year in New York City, I met a young Weinberg grad, now in med school. He was, he's working with mobile technology to fight diabetes. I've met young people who are using technology to connect people to jobs in Kenya, to blunt the impact of malaria in Botswana, to help the victims of Hurricane Sandy in Staten Island, to map the devastation of oil spills in the Louisiana Gulf, and to help people find and obtain clean water in India, to reconnect refugee families, to overthrow dictatorships, and there's so much more that we can do. And none of those people are much older than you are. Some are younger, some are a little bit older, but they're young people fighting for what they believe in and using technology to do it. And that brings me to the final message I want to impart to you today. You are never too young to make a difference. Let me paraphrase those great philosophers and classic hip hop artists, Eric B. and Rakim. For those who don't know them, go to YouTube, you'll love them. They once said, I know you got soul. If you didn't, you wouldn't be in here. Well, in case of you sitting in front of me graduating today, I know you got talent. If you didn't, you wouldn't be sitting there. And in a few minutes, you'll be both talented and credentialed. It's up to you how you're going to use your talent and your new credentials. I employ you to use them for something bigger than yourself. Ask yourself how you can make a difference in your church, or your temple, or your mosque, or your community, or your state, or your nation, or this great planet. What's your passion? What's your talent? How can you align them to drive change? I'm going to make you one guarantee. The next five years will be the most creative five-year period in global history. The innovations we saw over the last 20 years of the internet will be dwarfed by the changes we're going to see, and not just in information technology over the next five years. When you connect every person on the planet so that we can talk to each other and share information instantaneously, you can't help but see amazing growth and creativity. Don't sit on the sidelines during this time of change. At times like these, we're facing such seemingly intractable problems as a nation, as a planet, but have so many unprecedented tools to attack those problems, your potential to change the world, or to at least some small, uh, or at least some small portion of it, is almost limitless. I've loved the experiences I've had over the last 37 years, but I envy you for what you're likely to do over the next 37, and I'll make you a deal. How about we meet right here, 37 years from now, you tell me about your life's adventures, and I'll see if any of you remember anything I said today. <laughs> hail to purple, hail to white, hail to Weinberg, class of 2013.
Thanks so much, Larry. Those wonderful remarks.